Coming up. We're so happy that you guys are here. The formula is so simple. Seven stories. I remember this day like it was yesterday. Seven minutes each. The love that he could be and what he could show. Some of the storytellers are well known. There was uh, dancing on the roof of the Valdez Club bar. Others are not. About in the middle of the afternoon, I watched the life leave his face. So why is nearly every ticket sold and every seat filled? I think it's very hip. Arctic entries and the ancient art of storytelling. Why it survives? I had never, never felt what I felt when he took my hand in his. And thrives. Alaska, where there are old triumphs, but also new frontiers, with challenges as great as the state itself, but a belief that the best is yet to come, bringing you the faces the places and the spirit of the last frontier. This is Frontiers with Rhonda McBride. Welcome to our program. When it comes down to it, storytelling has always been about new frontiers. Whether it's a story about an unusual challenge or a moment in time, the need to tell stories is deep in our DNA. And that's what a group called Arctic Entries has tapped when it recruited Alaskans to tell their stories on stage once a month, seven stories per show. That was eight years ago and more than 500 stories ago. From the way people stream into the Performing Arts Center and snatch up those tickets, Thank you. you'd think there was some big headliner on stage. My mom was like, hey, do you want to come to one? And I'm like, sure, I'll try it out. And after I went to that first one that night, I'm like, I love it. I think it's very hip. The idea of storytelling evidently is very, very popular here. Almost always, every seat in the house is filled. The audience, ready to hear stories from people they don't even know. How do I sound? Okay. You sound good? No. Okay. <laughs> Many who are completely new to the stage, people like Penny Fairbanks. I'm a little nervous about it. Um, I, I just want to do the best job and honor my brother's memory. Penny is one of seven storytellers to face a crowd of almost 2,000 people who have come to get their storytelling fix. It's our last show of season nine. Tonight's theme is time lapse and it's seven stories from seven decades. Penny's story is from the 1980s about her brother, Tony. Hi. So it's spring of 1986. My brother, who's three years older than me, has called me to have dinner with him. And I'm just stuffing my face. He's like, I have something important to tell you. And you know, I'm like, ah. and he says, I'm gay. The week before the show, Penny rehearsed her story with some of the other storytellers. They get pointers on how to stick to their seven minute limit. If it goes off at seven minutes and you're still talking, you know, spend the next 15, 20 seconds getting to the end of the story. It doesn't mean like, okay, now my story's over. Each of the stories is very different. I was so scared, I never heard of Alaska before. Many of them condense a lifetime of experiences. Klawak was a magical place. And my grandma's home was a magical place. She was my foster grandmother. She had rescued me from poverty and hunger. Now is the time to refine the stories, to trim certain details. I visit him. He's looking thinner and thinner. So, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Penny is rattled because she forgot an important part of her story, her father's reaction to the news that his son was gay and had contracted HIV. You could, at that time, you could simply say, my dad is this like super rough redneck guy from the slope. But if she forgets again? When you're on the stage, the only person who's gonna know that's different is you. Yeah. And so if you do forget that part yeah. on stage, you just go with it. You executed it perfectly the other day, okay. you know, in your salon. Yeah. So just yeah, imagine yeah, yeah, yeah. you're in your salon. And uh, I can't have 2,000 people at my salon. <laughs> <laughs> That's about four inches, really. In her salon, Penny is not the storyteller, but the listener. I can't believe it myself. So, wow, you just told me that? You just said that out loud? And, you know, because hairdressing is such an intimate experience. I'm touching people. Those stories never leave these walls. And yet, Penny's own personal and painful story will soon be shared with the whole town. And that's truly what he looked like when he was healthy. The painting is based on a vision her dad had about his son the day after he died. 
I'm so proud of her. Some of Penny's longtime clients, like Denise Owens, know the story. She knows this story. She can do it well because she lived it. Denise says there was a time when Anchorage wasn't such a big city, back when people knew each other's stories. Stories, she says, we need now more than ever. When they hear their own stories, it makes people proud of our state, proud of our community. My husband and my dachshunds know this story very well. And Penny's not kidding about that. I have something to tell you. I'm gay. She practices her story between clients. I look at him, and he's got tears in his eyes. The dachshunds are attentive, yet have no idea how much they've helped Penny prepare for prime time. Okay, my parents get a phone call from my brother two days before Christmas. Mom and Dad, I'm in the hospital. I have pneumocystis pneumonia. I'm HIV positive. I'm gay. But nobody come down. I want you to stay in Alaska and have a Merry Christmas. Really? <laughs> Thank you, Tony. So my dad is a redneck oil guy, and he is flipping out. This is Tony before HIV, but the happy pictures ended when he was hospitalized. In fact, Tony refused to look in the mirror. Yet his father's attitude softened after he got to know the gay men in Tony's hospital ward, also infected with HIV, including one who had a partner. My dad was going to run out and get something, and so he would knock on their curtain and say, hey, do you boys need anything? And he pulled back the curtain, and he said, there they were, crying and holding each other. And he said for the first time he realized that the love that this, this man had for his partner was the love that he had for his wife. And that love was universal. In April 1990, it was her brother's turn to die. He was only 30. And about in the middle of the afternoon, I watched the life leave his face. And what's worse than watching my brother die is watch my parents lose their child. Today, a lot has changed since this painting. AIDS is no longer a death sentence, gay marriage more accepted. And Penny says she's grown a lot from those days. When my transgender child came home and told me and my husband his secret, we were able to be inclusive and loving, and I hope my brother would have been proud of me. Thank you. Call this a communal hearth, or a reminder that whatever your walk in life, it said the shortest distance between two people is a story. You can find Penny Fairbanks's full story as well as those of the other six storytellers in the Frontiers section of KTVA.com. Coming up, the secret sauce. Aaron Forbes and Katie Lawrence will tell us about some of the ingredients that go in each Arctic entry stew of stories. Seven storytellers a show but legions of volunteers who make it all happen. And joining us now, Aaron Forbes and Katie Lawrence from Arctic Entries. And of course, that's one of their big passion projects. And it seems like that's the case for all of your volunteers. Why is that? We love storytelling. We love how connected it makes us feel to other people and to the community. It's the opportunity to meet people in Anchorage we otherwise wouldn't have met, and then hear stories we otherwise wouldn't have heard. It's a great honor to be part of. It is amazing the range of stories you have, but first of all, I want to find out how we came up with the name Arctic Entries. <laughs> so it was actually one of our past musicians, uh, Lawrence, Lawrence Blakely, uh, was out on a hike one day and kind of just popped into her head and it really stuck. So we like to say that uh, the stories that we hear are when somebody comes in to the house, hear the, about this great thing that happened to me today, and they pass through an Arctic Entry. And I guess... Theoretically, metaphorically, you're passing through this entryway into Alaska mm -hmm. by hearing some of these stories. Well, what is it, do you think, is, is the secret sauce to all of this? Because, you know, in our day and age, it's so high tech. Um, people have to have special effects when they go see a movie to keep them entertained. Things just flash by at a rapid pace, and this is slowing things down. It's almost an antidote to that very thing. It is slowing things down, and it's bringing things down to the one-on-one the -on -one connection that I think a lot of people crave. 
Um, and the way we set up our show, we have three rules. And the first is that the story has to be true. So there's no fiction there. And so automatically, you're more likely to be able to relate to what the storyteller is talking about. The storyteller has to tell a story in the first person, so not something that happened to someone they know. So your empathy centers are, are triggered, and you want to listen, you want to feel. And then finally, um, the stories have to be told in seven minutes. So you have to tell the best, most concise version of your story, no matter how complicated or what span of time your story stretches. Seven minutes is it. And that seems to be a good number, because I think if it went on any longer, you might lose people. Exactly. And that's what we found. You know, we've looked at um, other storytelling organizations. The seven really seems to be a little bit of magic. You can listen to anything for seven minutes, <laughs> even if it's sad. <laughs> well, let's give uh, our viewers a little bit of a taste of some of the people, the seven storytellers. And I, I want to start with Donna Walker, First Lady Donna Walker. That was kind of a surprise to see her on the stage. Yeah, so that took a, a lot of logistics to get the first lady to tell a story. We had to work with her secretary and her social planner. Um, we also had to work through her daughter and say, hey, get your mom to tell a story on Arctic and Trees. Um, but she really just delighted the audience with her story of coming to Alaska right out of college to work at a man camp on the pipeline. <laughs> An amazing story. Let's take a look. Finally, my dad uh, set me off with a rifle and a shotgun. <laughs> One for the bears, he said, and the other for the boys, so. <laughs> well, it is amazing when you think about it. 4,000 men to about a dozen women, I believe, is what she said. Well, we, we had another uh, storyteller who's fairly well-known, Mao Tosi, an Anchorage community activist who also advocates for the youth. Tell us a little bit about his story. So, Mao, a lot of people know who he is, a lot of people know what he's passionate about, but I think fewer people know why he's passionate about what he does. And in his story, he shared a very personal and tender moment about his parents abandoning him and his siblings in high school, and how Mao had many choices at that point for the course that his life could take, and the power of one individual to shape everything that followed. Let's take a look. I'm tired of this life that I have right now, that I'm hungry. You know what? I'm going to go join my friends and sell drugs because I'm just hungry. And so it was the next day I went to lunch. I went and sat in my coach's office and I went and sat in there. I didn't say anything. I don't know. I was too proud or, or something to ask for help. And he said to me, Mile, here's $20. Go get me a burrito. Get yourself something to eat. And I thought to myself, what is he doing? You know, what is this? And not only that, I said, this guy isn't even my family. Why is he showing me this type of love? And I guess the, the coach kept doing that every day, <laughs> feeding him burritos uh, and sit, sparing his pride. One of, one of the things I was really touched about is this theme of love that, that organically was carried through the show. And of course, you have a, a, a very special connection to our next storyteller. Uh, Carmel Walder, and hers is a lot about love and the love you don't always get when you grow up in a dysfunctional family. But tell us a little bit about your connection to Carmel. So Carmel is my grandmother, and I've grown up listening to her stories, and every day I'm lucky to hear new ones. But family is very important to her and her heritage, and while I get to hear these stories all the time, I was really excited to see other people in the audience get to listen for the first time and kind of be touched by this very personal moment that she and had. You're so lucky because she's such a storyteller. Let's take a listen. He had a great sense of humor and the most beautiful eyes I had ever seen. About three weeks later, he asked me out. And when we were in the movie, he reached over and he took my hand in his. And I will never forget, I, I had been dating before, but I had never, never felt what I felt when he took my hand in his, as if I had been out in a rough sea all my life and I had come into a harbor where it was calm and I was safe. I pulled my hand away because... <laughs> I didn't want him to get the wrong idea. <laughs> so how did things turn out for your 
grandfather and grandmother. Obviously, <laughs> they stayed married. You're here. <laughs> yes, yes. They were married a few months after that, and they raised two kids in a little cabin out the road in Juneau. So many adventures yet to tell, huh? Yes. And that's just it, is you're just sort of tapping sort of the tip of the iceberg, you know, and to... You know, a lot of people often say that Alaska is the mother load of, of great stories. And you think this uh, event sort of proves that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Alaska is such a rarefied environment. You know, we're in so many ways, we're not in control of our narrative. It's the weather and the elements and the animals. And with the, that combination of influences, the stories that come out of this state are just so unique and so intense in, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Um, when you pair the isolation with the extremes uh, that we see here, it's just gold that comes out in the form of stories. You know, besides the gold, I guess there's the gold that you raise <laughs> <laughs> for the for the nonprofits that the, the proceeds go to. And we have a, a graphic here that will show you how much has been raised over the years, quite a bit for different organizations. You know, why did you decide to do this? <sighs> You know, honestly, it didn't start out as a fundraiser. It was just a fun thing for friends to do as they got together. But it became clear that this was a pretty powerful avenue to raise money um, and to do some good in the community beyond the directness of the storytelling. Um, so every year, we choose a nonprofit partner. We try to make them as local as possible, and we try to make them as uh, human-oriented as possible because, after all, that's what storytelling is about. You kind of feel sorry for the early nonprofits because... <laughs> You see that number just mushroom, and in fact, uh, we have another snapshot to show you. $200,000 raised well, over, really, over this, what, nine-season period? We're right. Re we're really proud of that number, and, and we're really hopeful that uh, even though that number has grown and these new partners that we've been making have really reaped the benefits of our growth, that that money goes out into the community and that that passes on dividends all throughout the community, not just within that nonprofit, but to all the people they touch and beyond that. And 555 storytellers help raise that, and, and that number is growing. So tell us about uh, your upcoming season. Uh, you always go with a theme. What's, what's the first show going to be? So we're going on summer break now. Um, it's a lot harder to get people in a theater when the weather's nice. <laughs> so we will be starting again in September, and the theme for that show is Milepost One, stories of setting out starting fresh, and finding your way home. Why do you always go with a theme around each show? We think it's really helpful to add weight and meaning to every story when they come together around a cohesive message, but we work really hard to find a variety of storytellers with different backgrounds and different takes on that theme. So are you all ready with all your storytellers lined up? <laughs> we are at zero. <laughs> <laughs> and we have some information we'll show you here if you're interested. But, but tell us, you know, what it is that people need to tell you to get hooked up into this. We honestly don't need very much. You can go to arcticentries.org. There's a button there, tell your story. You click on that button, put in your contact information. Um, even a one-line synopsis is all we need. And then we'll follow up with you to hear your story in person. It doesn't have to be polished. That's, that's why we're here. And it doesn't have to be seven minutes to start. So how, how does that process go when you first connect with somebody? Well, we get a tip from maybe a past storyteller, someone who's seen a show, or someone who finds us another way. They pitch a story maybe on our website, and we'll sit down with them maybe over coffee and just ask them to tell us their story. And we work with them to whittle that down into the best possible seven minutes they can share. So a lot of times you are picking people that are very new to the stage. I mean, it, it must you know, seem overwhelming to stand there and have 2,000 people. You know, if, if that's not what you do, Maltosi, the First Lady, they're used to speaking. How, sure. do you, how do you get around that? Honestly, we credit our audience more than we can say. They are the warmest, most empathetic group of people you can imagine. They will laugh at anything, cry at anything. And so the moment when you get up on stage and you feel those lights, the nervousness tends to evaporate. And you can feel that warmth and that energy, and it's your story. You've lived it. And so you just tell your story, and the reaction is always positive. You know, there are so many different kinds of stories how do you think that helps us as Alaskans? Well, we like to say that our mission is building community one story at a time. And I think part of that is allowing an audience to hear a variety of perspectives, things they may not have heard before, but they still find relatable because it's one person telling that story to them. 
So I think bringing those diverse ideas around is really important. Well, when you collect people for these stories, uh, do you often, you know, find what you need? I mean, you to fit your theme, like this last one was time lapse, seven stories, seven decades. We try to keep our themes very broad so that, like Katie said, a wide variety of storytellers can, can share what they have to share. That said, it can often just help serve as a prompt. You know, a lot of times we'll find someone and they say, oh, I don't have any stories. And you say, oh, well, the, the theme is about taking risks. And then they'll say, oh, no, I have a story. <laughs> and then it winds up being the most amazing thing you've ever heard. <laughs> and, I, and I appreciate, you know, giving us the backstory on how all of this works. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you. Well, again, we will have each of our stories on our website, atva.com. Just go to the Frontier section. Up next, songs, another form of storytelling. On the Caribou Tundra. In the wild barren land, on the fierce Arctic ice, where the polar bears stand. It's an art that this singer-songwriter has perfected over a lifetime. <laughs> How it's earned him an honor he never dreamed possible. About 1,400 degrees were recently conferred at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Among them, three honorary doctorates, and one of those went to a man known as Hobo Jim, or simply Hobo. I'm Hobo Jim. When Hobo Jim is invited to events, he usually brings his guitar. This time, he'll be on stage without it, and soon give up his trademark cowboy hat. So how do you feel without the hat? Bald. <laughs> Was that in the back? There we go. Perfect fit. Before the ceremony begins, he sits with Jake Adams, also an honorary doctorate recipient, who tells him he just landed his 50th whale. I like to hunt, but I've never hunted a whale. Hobo was pretty impressed. Well, there's a part of me wild and free. But Hobo Jim has an impressive record, too. In my heart, there's a wild wolf. As a writer of more than 600 songs, many of them about life in Alaska. This doctorate thing here is, is for everybody. It's for, for all of you that supported me this many years. I appreciate it. And now count the university among his fans, not just for his big body of work, but for songs which have attracted tourists from all over the world and have turned him into an unofficial ambassador for Alaska. I am pleased to present James Hobo Jim Barsos. Yeah. Hobo Jim was also recognized for his success in Nashville, where famous artists like George Jones, Etta James, and Randy Travis have recorded his music. As a young man, Hobo hitchhiked, collected experiences for his songs, and never dreamed he'd be seated here in this crowd, holding an honorary doctorate in fine arts. Also, a big congratulations to Jake Adams for his honorary doctorate. He's a North Slope business leader from Utkiavik and a founder of the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. Well, it sounds like he has some amazing stories to tell as well. Well, we leave you now with one of the bands that performed at this past Arctic Entry show, Blackwater Railroad from Seward. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. To feel so low down yet feel so tall I'm free for you I'm free